Romany and Back by G. Bramwell Evans. Give me the clear blue sky over my head and the green turf beneath my feet, a winding road before me, and then to thinking. Chapter 14 The Night Vigil, August. It was good to see Jerry again, and by the gleam in his eyes I knew that he had a welcome for Rack and me. "'You're looking rare well,' said he. "'As brown as a berry, I reckon that caravan life suits you.' I went over to him and felt the muscles of his arms. "'I do believe you have been doing some work,' I said, while Rack sniffed round his leggings and sorted out the various scents which still clung to them. He laughed. Just a bit of harvesting for Alan and Joe, said he, but I've got to be careful not to overdo it, you know. We pulled out our pipes and sat on the grass that fringed the outside of his cottage. Did John Fell ask you to take a night for him to guard his young pheasants, I asked. Quite a few, answered Jerry. Did anything interesting turn up, I queried. Well, said my companion, blowing out great puffs of smoke. There was one old dog-fox rather persistent-like. I settled myself comfortably to hear the story. You know that hut where John stops? he asked. I nodded. Right in the middle of the big spinney, I answered. I got down there, Jerry continued, and as dusk came on, one by one, the young pheasants went nicely up into the pines to roost. The old cocks, as they went into the branches, sang out their hoarse challenge. They like to let everyone know that it's bedtime, you know. Everything, as I had the last walk round, were peaceful and content. In my mind's eye, I was visualising the scene. The great masses of the pines in one thick shadow. The ride, which divided them almost light in comparison with their indigo depth. Still night save for some bird giving itself a final preen before settling down to sleep, or a fleeting glance of a white moth as the light of the stars fell upon its silken sails. Above the ground, the world of wing asleep. On the ground, the thickets slightly moving as some unseen hunter followed an enticing trail. Then, after a bit, I heard my companion saying, there seemed to be a stir among the roosting birds. Once I heard one of them call out in fear. The restlessness were like a wave. It touched a belt of trees and were gone. Then as I walked out to see what was the cause of it, it had waken up again in some other part of the woods. He pulled meditatively at his pipe, Rack watching his every movement and gazing at him as though he were following every word. I visited the lamps to see that they were all right, but when I had a look round as dawn were breaking, I saw an old fox slinking away over a hill that leads to the fells. So you're a varmint that's disturbing the peats, are you? I thought. The lamps are for frightening of foxes, aren't they? I asked. Jerry nodded. The light frightens them for a time, said he, but they get used to them. I reckon it'd take a moving searchlight to scare away a determined hungry one. And has he got any of the pheasants? I asked anxiously. Not as far as I could see, said Jerry. But he badly scared him. How'd you like to be sitting up in the branches on a dark night and open your eyes to see two green balls of flame shining up at you? I should sit tight, knowing that he couldn't climb the tree. I should probably pull faces at him, I said. But what if them eyes kind of hypnotise you and started pulling you down with invisible wires, eh? asked Jerry earnestly. A fox can't do that, surely, I said disbelievingly. Well, how does he get him down to the ground then? asked the old poacher. Oh, I said, when you find a bird a fox has killed, it has been an odd one that's decided to roost either low down or under some bush. You have to take that into account, of course, said he. But when all's been said on them grounds, you're still to find out how they tie some down from branches higher up. And is that the end of the story? I asked, as Jerry did not seem to be too eager to continue. No, said he, 
That sort of thing happened again and again when I was on duty. So I had a word with John about it and then slipped down to old Simeon Boswell's camp. What he don't know about foxes ain't worth knowing. Or pheasants, I said, smiling. I told him what had happened and he whistled up old bars and spoke to him like a Christian for a few minutes. Then said something about cherry cloths in the wesh and the dog followed me like a lamb. "'Pheasants in the wood,' said I, interpreting the Romany words. "'Well,' continued he, "'the dog and me went to the hut, and I thought we were in for a quiet night. "'Suddenly I heard the first stir among the birds, and so I went outside with Bath. "'He paused for a moment, rose, and acted the whole scene before me. "'The dog pricked up his ears, then up went his nose, "'and I could see the fur round his neck rising like a stiff brush.' But never a sound fell from his lips. He gave me one inquiring look and I patted him. Good dog, said I, and the old fella, with me behind him, led towards where the birds were being scared. I soon lost him in the darkness. Then I heard a big snarl and the sound of a body hurling itself through the brushwood. Then silence. He'd found the fox all right, I said. Jerry nodded. I stood where I was for some minutes while only owls hooted overhead. Then, away on the fringe of the woods, there come the sound of another skirmish, and he heard no more till Boz returned and nosed me out with his tongue lying out and a look in his eyes which said, We've been having a high old time. Did he get the fox? I asked eagerly. Only a bit of him, said my friend. There were a bunch of red fur hanging onto the side of his jaws, and old Reynard took away a bit of Boz's left ear as a souvenir of their meeting. But there were no more scurrying of pheasants in that wood. Old Boz must have done a bit of skilful stalking to get onto the fox as well as he did, I said. Aye, oh, you bet he did. And then Jerry gave one of his delightful chuckles. I love to hear them. They are like bubbling springs, and somehow or other join up with one's own inner ripples. What's the joke? I asked. Oh, he laughed. When I think of the old gypsy's dog defending John's pheasant while he himself is asleep in bed and Jerry the poacher leading the attack, I interpolated. It's enough to make a cat laugh, said he. After finishing our pipes, Jerry asked me whether I had ever seen a badger. Not very often, I answered. We'll walk up and see his set if you like. I caught sight of old Brock sneaking back to his den in the early morning hours as I was returning to the hut. I rather fancy he's been taking his young family out for their supper. As we walked down the lane towards the wood which Jerry had pointed out, he called my attention to the swallows resting on the barn of the farm. That's a sign that autumn's on us. It looks as though they've called a meeting to settle the route they'll take to the south. I listened to the twittering. Low and full enunciated. It sounded as though the birds were, as Jerry said, discussing the details of their long flight. Soon we were in the wood, and the dogs stood sniffing outside what looked like an enlarged rabbit hole. That's where old silver muzzle enters, said my companion. Anyone might think this was only the entrance to a large warren, I said. Not with such a pad mark as yon, said Jerry pointing to a five-toed impression in the soft sand. Look at the strong marks on the claws. Rabbits only leave little pinpoint pricks behind them. The paws that made them tracks are the finest spades in the world. But get down on your knees and see if you can find anything else. I did as my friend asked, and after searching at the entrance came across two telltale silver hairs. That settles it, said I. And looking down its dark depths, I asked, I wonder how big the burrow is? Jerry thought for a moment, and then answered, Dare walk for a hundred yards straight on, and then take a turn to the right for fifty or sixty more. Him then I reckon you won't have covered it. I looked at him incredulously. There's been badgers here for scores of years, he said. You never see much of them, said I. No, continued my friend, and if you've been hunting with terriers and shot up in small boxes and made a fight for your life, and when you recover from your wounds, made a fight again until at last you're pegged out with weakness, 
then you'd not show yourself abroad very much. But for all that, there are far more badgers about than folk know of, and year after year they enlarge their burrows till nobody knows how big they are. I walked on a little way and found Rack scratching out a rabbit hole. He was turning away the roots with his teeth, digging with his front paws, and kicking out the loosened soil with quick strokes of his hind legs. There must be a rabbit or two in there, I said, bringing Jerry to the spot. What if, as they burrow down, they strike the badger's corridors? Will Brocky drive them out? Jerry shook his head. That badger's set so big that it'll hold not only a rabbit family, but in another part of it I've known a fox to live. I don't suppose if they ever lived in the same flat they would ever run up against one another, but... Here he paused such a long time that I said, Well? You know that a badger is a very clean animal, don't you? I nodded. Well, said Jerry slowly, if I were a badger and a fox lived within fifty yards of me, I should order quarts of old look alone. But perhaps he likes it. One man's meat is another man's poison, you know, I said. Aye, said Jerry, and perhaps a fox's stench is a badger's fragrance. It's a queer world and no mistake. <laughs>